Let's begin looking at 2 Thessalonians. But before we look at 2 Thessalonians, we have to understand, of course, it is the second epistle to the Thessalonians. We have to review a few key points from 1 Thessalonians in order to understand the appropriate background for 2. You can't really understand 2 Thessalonians unless you understand it's the second epistle to that church. Certain points are highlighted in the first epistle that are elaborated on in the second one, and we have to take that into account. Now, Paul, of course, was in a situation where as soon as he got to Europe, there was opposition. When he was still in Asia, there was despair. Not ready to give up on life. As soon as he lands, he winds up in jail in Philippe. He comes to Thessalonica. Eventually, he has to even get out of town in Berea. At Athens, the intellectuals didn't like him. Only a few got saved. It was a difficult time. Breaking new soil in a mission field is always, always difficult. It's always difficult. That's why in Acts 13, the Spirit said, Set out for me Barnabas and Saul. You don't send amateurs or new believers to mission fields. You don't send amateurs. Um, I'm not talking about you don't send your youth group to Guatemala to build a Sunday school or something on a summer project. That's not a problem, okay? Some volunteer missionary thing for a month or something. That's something different. That may be a way that the Holy Spirit can even speak to young people if God's calling them to the mission field later on in life. But it's no place for amateurs. It's no place for young believers. They're always going to get into trouble. They will always get into trouble, theologically, morally, and otherwise. Um, I've said this before, and I will defend it to the hilt. There's one organization that has no scriptural right to exist. They've actually told Polynesians that you can call Jesus by the name of Pele, the volcano god, and things. I'm speaking about youth with the mission. They had people saved three months going to foreign mission fields where there's other religions. Other, these people know nothing. They don't even know... The, New Testament doctrine well. They certainly don't know biblical languages and how to translate biblical languages into tribal languages or anything that a real missionary would know. It takes a long time to train up a missionary. It's not something that you get overnight if you're a real one. You know, it's more like the Mormons knocking on doors or something. Real missionaries are not like that. Real missionaries are church planters. They understand the culture and the language of the places they're going to. And they know there's going to be hardship. They know there's going to be hardship. When you read the testimonies of real missionaries, they were pioneers. People like Hudson Taylor or William Carey or or Judson Cornwall or um, so many, so many missionaries of, of William Burton. He went to the Congo where they never saw a white person before. They'd never seen one. There was one after the Reformation, the first European missionary to go to a a pagan tribal culture, Justinian Wells, and he disappeared. Nobody ever heard from him again. He went down to the Mesquite Coast in Central America. These, there were actually missionaries going places. They didn't know if they'd ever come back. They didn't know if they would ever come back. And some of them didn't. Some of them didn't. And you know, there are areas of the world, it's still like that. I was in Saudi Arabia not long ago. I was just looking at the possibilities of seeing if any of our stuff was getting in by internet and things like this. The church there, it's completely underground, completely underground, the indigenous church. But now the door may be opening just a little bit in Saudi Arabia, just a little bit. Please pray that the Lord opens it, but please pray that the right kind of people get in. (laughs) You know? (laughs) When the Iron Curtain opened up, Some good people went into Russia with the gospel, but so did con artists, cults, hypesters of every possible description. Um, It's a serious business. Serious missions are serious business. Paul did not have it easy. He just went from jail to jail. (laughs) Sometimes he had to get out of town pretty quick. If you're not willing to do that. Now, in those situations... This is where you will sometimes see people with the grace to be single, with the grace to be single. 
Somebody who's going to smuggle Bibles into Iran does not need a wife and kids waiting for him in Ohio because he might not be coming home. You know what I'm saying? It's a serious business. It's Thank God for my wife and all this stuff and the blessings of marriage, family, children, all that. But those who have the grace to be single for the sake of the ministry, for the sake of the gospel, those who actually have that grace have a higher calling than the rest of us. It's a higher calling than if they really have that grace. Now, when they have that grace, God gives that grace because of the nature of the ministry they're called to. I know a medical missionary, a woman born in England, grew up in America. She takes care of AIDS babies in Africa. She's a medical missionary. She's got 40 babies, all of them sick. She has no time to have a baby of her own. She has the grace to be single. Now, if you have a baby and children, God bless you, but she has a higher calling. You know, <laughs> if you've got a wife and kids, God bless you. It's God's blessing. But somebody who's smuggling Bibles into Iran has a higher calling. Certain people have it. It's a serious business. Missions are not to be taken lightly. When we study the background of what happens in Thessalonica, we have to understand where Paul was coming from and what he was going through in light of the book of Acts. <coughs> Much of his ministry in northern Greece, Macedonia, is around Acts chapter 17, around there. That tells you a lot of the background of, of what he was going through. It's always good to read these things in light of the historical circumstances of, of the author, of Paul. But I only mention these things in passing. Now, by way of introduction once again, and I know most of you know this, I say it for the camera. God uses different literary genre in his word for different purposes. It's apocalyptic, there's Hebrew poetry, there's narrative, there's wisdom literature, there's all kinds. The epistles are letters. They are the literary genre that God uses to explain the rest of Scripture. <coughs> we read the rest of Scripture through the prism of the epistles. If you want to know what Jesus meant, look at what the apostles taught. Jesus told the apostles, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of all that I've taught you. They explain what Jesus meant. Think of the epistles as inspired commentary. Inspired commentary. Their main purpose is to explain the rest of God's word. Okay? If you want to know what the gospel is, read Romans. If you want to know what the gospel is not, read Galatians. Okay? If you want to understand how Jesus fulfills the Levitical sacrificial system and how he fulfills the law, read Hebrews. Okay? All these things. Well, Thessalonians explains the teaching of Jesus on the last days, on eschatology. That's the main purpose of 2 Thessalonians and to a large degree of 1 Thessalonians. Don't begin with the book of Revelation. Begin by reading the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 25, Luke 21, Luke 17, things like that, Mark 13, and then read Thessalonians and understand the Olivet Discourse in light of what Paul says. Okay? It's the commentary. It makes it simple. Now, epistles can be understood different ways. There's pastoral epistles written to individuals. There's epistles to churches. That's one way that people categorize them. There's another way that they should be categorized, however, that is too often understated. There are epistles written specifically to Jews. James, Hebrews, Peter, and Jude, they're written to Jews. That does not mean that what they say does not apply to non-Jews. It simply means to understand how it applies to non-Jews, you have to first understand what it meant to Jews. I point that out for the following reason. Whenever the epistles use Midrash, or they use typology, they explain what it means. They explain what it means. The only exceptions are elements of things like Jude, written to Jews, where from their culture and their religious tradition, the author knows they would have known what he was talking about. You understand? 
if the apost- if the you have in the Galatians four the two women Sarah and Hagar, two cities the bondwoman and the free woman. Well, how did Paul get that? Well, he's using midrashic hermeneutics. He's interpreting the Bible the way Jews did in the first century. Okay, but he explains it. He explains it. It's easy to interpret the epistles because you can take them with simple grammatical historical exegesis. You don't have to look for Pesher interpretations. If there is a Pesher interpretation, (coughs) it'll tell you what it is, okay? It'll explain it. Symbolism. Well, you got the Lord's Supper. The first Corinthians is the most paschal epistle about Passover and Jesus as the Lamb and explains the Lord's Supper. But it explains the symbolism of the Passover for believers. Whenever you have symbolism, midrash, typology in the epistles, it explains what it is. Unless it's something written specifically to Jews where the author knew that they already knew the background of what it means. Everybody clear with what I'm saying? Does anybody not understand? So you can simply use grammatical, historical exegesis with the epistles. You can just take it line by line. Okay, the original meaning of the original language, line by line, verse by verse, it's the simplest. It explains other scripture. You know, if you have a quadratic equation or a, polyno- a second-order differential equation, it looks like a complicated mess. But a good math teacher can show you <coughs> the arithmetic. Once you get the arithmetic, then you can understand the algebraic content. Okay? It's the same with calculus, you know. Always go back to the basics. Always go back to the basics. You know, you don't begin with calculus. You begin with arithmetic. Well, scripture is the same thing. Begin with the epistles. They explain other scripture. Don't ever read anything else in scripture until you put on your reading glasses. Your reading glasses being the epistles, okay? <coughs> so many of the errors and the false teachings in the church today could be avoided if people read the Gospels in light of the epistles, of what the apostles said Jesus meant, okay? You ask anything in my name, hallelujah. Yeah, well, when you read the epistles, if you ask according to his will, <laughs> if you ask with right motives, <laughs> if you ask with right motives. You know, they just like to take what Jesus said and that becomes, the, I, I'm claiming it, I believe the word of God, Jesus said it. But the apostles explain what he meant. You read the rest of scripture through the prism of the epistles. I know most of you know that, but I say it for the recording and for the internet, okay? With this in view, let's begin Second Thessalonians by looking at certain features, first of all, in First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. The two epistles were probably written less than a year of each other, maybe six to eight months, within six to eight months of each other. Okay? And again, they're written during a period of persecution. Now let's look at one verse in the first chapter of First Thessalonians. Verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Just those two verses are loaded. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you'll have no other gods before me. No matter what people say, the Greek word proskuto, to bow before. The Hebrew word, hishtahavot, to bow down, to genuflect, to prostrate. You shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Is there a problem with religious art? Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper? Well, it's not very accurate as to what the Last Supper would have looked like, but I have no problem with the art itself. There are some paintings by Rembrandt with biblical themes that are actually quite good, but theologically, you know. But uh, 
That's religious art. But when you bow down to an icon, when you bow down to a statue, no matter what a Roman Catholic or a Greek Orthodox person more so tells you, that is idolatry. In the Greek Orthodox tradition, to which some evangelicals have apostatized, Hank Hanegraaff, Francis Schaeffer's son Frankie, uh, Andrew Walker, professor of theology from Britain, former evangelical, they've apostatized into Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, Eastern Orthodoxy believes that an icon is a metaphysical window into the spiritual realm. You pray through the icon, that it has a power. This is superstition. It is fetishism. It is idolatry. No matter what they say. I was just at my mother's funeral, and I have a cousin who was a charismatic Catholic, quote-unquote. And she believes it's okay for her to remain in the Catholic Church and do all this hocus-pocus stuff. Hocus-pocus comes from the Mass, hoc est corpus meum in Latin, this is my body. Okay? She believes it's somehow compatible. No, no. If you're really born again, the Holy Spirit's going to show you, stop doing that stuff. We don't engage in necromancy. We don't pray to the dead. We don't worship transubstantiated elements as the return of Christ. We don't do those things. Do I say that somebody cannot be in the Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic Church and not be saved? No. But if they are saved, the Holy Spirit is going to show them to get out of it. You cannot be in the will of God and remain in a church that requires you to practice necromancy, superstition, and idolatry. And that includes the Church of Rome. Let no one tell you differently. And Thessalonica, their problems began when they wouldn't go along with this. Now understand, this was the culture. Here in the United States, because of its Protestant, largely Protestant heritage, you don't see real Roman Catholicism in the United States. You see it in Mexico. You see it in Poland. You see it in Ireland. You see it in Italy. But to see real Catholicism, you have to go to a Catholic country. You've got a diluted form of it here. Same with Islam. It's a diluted form. You don't see real Islam much in the United States. You don't see what it really is. Uh, you see a sanitized version repackaged for Western consumption or something like that, but you don't see the real deal. Well, you know, the real deal is the idolatry and superstition permeates the culture. It permeates the culture. That's true in an Islamic country. It's true in, in, in Greece, in a Greek Orthodox country. It's true in a Roman Catholic country, a real Catholic country. What you see in North America is not the real deal. You see a sanitized version of these things. You understand? Paul is talking about people who have to deal with the real deal in verse 9. In verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. We are not appointed unto wrath. That first word, write it down in Latin letters if you don't know Greek. Orge, O-R-G-A, wrath. I will say this, and I'll repeat it once later on. Wrath comes from God. Tribulation comes from the devil. The two are not synonyms. One of the fundamental errors of our pre-tribulational friends and brethren, and I have many good brethren who are pre-trib, one of the fundamental errors upon which that wrong belief is predicated requires making the ellipsis and orge synonyms. They are not synonymous. They are two different things with two different meanings. There's also a third term, paresmos. I won't deal with that now. It's not really pertinent to the immediate context. But the two basic terms, the ellipsis and wrath, the ellipsis being a tribulation and wrath, in Hebrew, likewise, there are two different terms. In Hebrew, the wrath of God is called haron yah, haron yah. It's something terrible. But tribulation is called sorot. You get the Yiddish word sorus, trouble. <laughs> okay. 
Sorot. There are different words in Greek and Hebrew, entirely different words. They must not be confused. And we see in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, Paul draws a distinction between the two. Bear that in mind. We then get to verse 5 of chapter 2. We never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Con artist money teachers and money preachers are not a new phenomena. They've always been around. The mass media have turned them into corrupt empires, but they are not new. There's always been religious con artists. Always. Always. And obviously, the Thessalonians were exposed to them. The Thessalonians were exposed to them. Let us continue looking further. Chapter 2, verse 18. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Be careful, of course, of the binding and loosing crowd. Satan doesn't want us to come. We take authority over you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We're going to Thessalonica, hallelujah. We'll bind you in the name of Jesus. As we've pointed out many times, that is not what binding and loosing means. Luo and Deo, Asur and Hatir, we have other teachings explaining it. If it was a simple formula that when you get opposition in doing something you believe the Lord's calling you to do, as all you have to do is bind Satan and he has to conform to your pronouncing him bound, this is complete lunacy. Now, there is the gambit clause. All things work together for the better. It was like when I was a kid, there was the famous chess match in uh, Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, between Bobby Fischer, he was an anti-Semitic Jew, he cracked up, and, and Boris Spatsky, who was the chess master of Russia, and it was during the Cold War, so it had all kinds of political overtones. And Bobby Fischer would, would come late every day just to get Spassky irritated. So Spassky would come, Dobry Utra, good morning, you're late. <laughs> every morning, that's the only thing Spassky said to Fischer, you're late. And Fischer, in the afternoon, said one thing to Spassky, checkmate. <laughs> that was the entire conversation between the two of them. Um, what am I saying? When God allows Satan to have a victory, it blows up in his face, it backfires. It's always a gambit. Think of the crucifixion of Jesus. Satan thought he won. Not understanding that God made a way for Jesus to atone for our sin and then raise him from the dead to give us eternal life and reverse the curse of death. It was a gambit. Check, checkmate. There's the checkmate clause in Romans chapter 8. When God allows Satan to win a battle, it's only so he's going to lose the war. That part is true. But we have to understand in the greater purposes of God, when we're dealing with missions and mission strategy, there is tremendous opposition. Our ministry, Moriel, we operate in some difficult places. We're in the process of opening Moriel, India, with Dalit children from the lower caste system in Andhra Pradesh in, in, in India. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to even go to it. I'm going to have to send people in my stead because of my health. But we're doing it. It's difficult. And, you know, I have been to Vietnam with this many times with this tremendous persecution and China, and I've been to Saudi Arabia, and I've seen tremendous poverty in Africa, and we take care of rubbish dump kids in the, kid, in, in the Philippines. I know about the poverty and ignorance and even persecution. The strongest opposition I have ever seen to the gospel 
the strongest social opposition, the strongest spiritual opposition I have ever seen to the gospel is Israel. It's Jews and Arabs, the children of Abraham. Jews and Arabs. People are open to the gospel in most of the third world. Even in the face of persecution, the churches grow. <laughs> in, in places I've been to, I've seen it. But when you're dealing with Abraham's descendants, the Jews and Arabs, oh my Lord. <laughs> oh my Lord. It's something. And I, I speak from experience now. I'm not just speaking from somebody who hasn't been to these places and doesn't know what these things are. I've dealt with all of these things. I've been to these places. I've spent time in these places. I know what it is. But I lived for years in Israel. It's where Satan got his biggest defeat and it's where he will get his final defeat. And he is, oh my Lord. If he, can lo if he loses the Jews and the Arabs, you know... It's through Abraham that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. You'd think the first ones to accept Christ would be Jews and Arabs, and they're the hardest of all the people, all the nations, all the... If he loses them, he loses the game. Ooh, and he's fighting tooth and nail. Well, spiritual opposition must be understood. Satan was hindering. Satan was hindering. Let's continue a little bit further now with the first Thessalonians. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. He's coming with the saints. That is the parousia. This is a central polemic against dominion theology. Uh, again, Brother Al Dagger, going to be with the Lord this week, wrote a fantastic book, Vengeance is Ours, exposing the folly of, of, of dominion, dominionism. You know what dominion theology is. We're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes, set up his kingdom, then he's going to come for a victorious church. That is their teaching. It combines ex charismatic extremism and uh, a, a radical form of Calvinism called Reconstructionism, or Theonomist Reconstructionists. And uh, they do this, and it, it, it was traditionally associated with a false teaching called the man-child, the manifest sons, what they believed that the super church was going to do all this stuff. You know, this, is, this was what was in the back of the... John Wimber and the Kansas City false prophets and all these things with, with these people doing these things. And it is a big element of influence in the New Apostolic Reformation today. It's always been there, but it's big time now. We have to understand he's not coming for a victorious church. He's coming with a victorious church. He's coming with the victorious church. Okay. Now let's look further. Chapter 4. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. There was persecution going on in Thessalonica. I have pointed out many times, you're not going to see the book of Acts in the Western world yet. I've seen true Christians in California and in England and in Australia and many places. I've seen true Christians. But if you want to see true Christianity like the book of Acts, where they really love each other like a family, I can show you that in Vietnam. I can show you that in Vietnam. Uh, they're persecuted. They have no hope in this world. Their only hope is in the Lord coming, and they're just holding on and sticking together. That's, that's the way it, it was. Now, that will become a necessity for the whole world before Jesus comes. 
Why will the Lord allow this persecution? You'll be hated for all nation, by all nations. To clean the dead wood out of the church. Persecution becomes a necessary evil. Is it Satan? Yes. But it's going to be a gambit. God is going to allow it. It's the ones who don't need to be persecuted, who get it first and worst. It's the devil. It's no good. It's no good. But God brings good from it. You understand? And if there's one thing that characterizes a persecuted church, it's the love they have. They don't see themselves as an institution or an organization. They see themselves as a family that are committed to each other. I don't like her, but she's my sister. What can I do? She's broke. I got to help her out. <laughs> oh, God. It's Uncle Godfrey. He's broke again. <laughs> Who is it now? What electric company? Turn off his lights. I wish he wasn't my uncle. But he is. <laughs> well, these people are like that. Only... <laughs> It's not personal irresponsibility or anything. It's persecution. It's persecution. We have one guy, I was in Vietnam. He was saved a month. He was saved a month, and the local Communist Party instigated a local pogrom against the believers. He and one child escaped. He, one child, and another believer in the house escaped. His wife and four of his kids were burned alive. He'd been saved one month. One month. One month. And when you meet people like this, it's very sobering, but it's very humbling. There are people like that. He'd only been saved a month. But he let everybody know that Jesus is the way. That's what happened. Uh, it goes on. It, but you know what? In Vietnam, every time I go back there, and I don't know if I'll be able to anymore with my legs, but every time I go there, those churches are growing. <laughs> Those churches are growing. It's fine and necessary to know the theology, but the application of the theology to our lives and to our ministries and our churches is more important, isn't it? What good is the head knowledge on its own? Okay. Then he goes on. Those who died in Christ, in verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Remember, unsaved people die, Christians sleep. They wake up again. They're in the conscious presence of the Lord in a different sphere of perception, eternity. So that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. We can mourn, but we do not grieve. It is a temporary separation. Remember, I've said this many times. I just said it to Al Dagger's wife yesterday when I called her. There's only one fitting epitaph for any truly saved Christian on the headstone. Temporarily closed for repairs. Will reopen soon. John 5, 24. The man believes in me. Though he die, yet shall he live. That is the only epitaph any saved believer in Jesus needs to have. Temporarily closed for repairs, will reopen soon, John 5, 24. Okay? I always tell that to believers when somebody pops their clogs. For we say this in verse 15, to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who've fallen asleep. Now we explain this on our teaching on the silver trumpets. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. This is not a shofar, it is not a ram's horn, it's a silver horn. The problem is in Greek, you've got the same word, solipigo. You have to go to the Hebrew to understand there's two different horns. One is a ram's horn and one is silver. Okay, shofar and silver horn. Okay. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, harpezot, snatched away 
with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It doesn't matter if you're alive when Jesus comes or if you check out before he gets here. We shall be as he is. We will be with the Lord in the air. Okay? That was the basis of their thinking. Yet at the present time, we have people in the church who deny the truth of the rapture. People who claim to be believers deny it. Gerald Coates in England says it's a fantasy and a myth. Rick Joyner has said it is, is, is the lie of the devil. Mike Bickle has taught that the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. These people are false teachers. They are false teachers. Now understand something here. Look how it says, those who are asleep, that's those who've checked out, right? And those who are alive when the Lord comes. Let us dispel the next error that people often propagate in association with 2 Thessalonians. Turn with me to Titus chapter 2, verse 13, please. Looking for the blessed hope. And the appearing, that's parousia, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This verse points to the deity of Christ, doesn't it? It's Christological, says he's God. And it refers to him in heaven, calls him Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now let's understand this. There are people who say, sincerely believe, that the rapture is the blessed hope. Paul tells the Thessalonians, don't grieve like people who have no hope because somebody died. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope includes the rapture, but it is inclusive of the rapture and the resurrection. They are two aspects of the same nearly simultaneous event. Okay? It doesn't matter if somebody gives up the ghost before the Lord comes or if they're alive when the Lord comes. It doesn't matter. It's the same blessed hope. I had a very nice man, a sincere man in the north of England say to me once, somebody told me that you don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. And he came to my meetings a lot of times. He always, always liked me. He thought I was the best thing since sliced bread until he found out. that Anyway, and I said, no, I, I, I don't. And I can explain why if you'd like. You don't have the blessed hope. I said, well, did Paul have the blessed hope? He said, yes. Well, and how come he wasn't raptured? <laughs> I mean, actually, he wasn't, but he came back, you know, in Second Corinthians. I mean, every believer from the day of Pentecost onward has had the blessed hope. We've always had the blessed hope. It is not limited to those who are alive when the Lord comes. It doesn't matter if you are alive or if you're not biologically alive. We all have the same blessed hope. How these people do these things, they can be quite reasonable and quite exegetically correct in dealing with other subjects and issues. But when it comes to the return of Jesus, they give themselves license to do things that are not even logical. Why are you treating Thalipsis and Orge as synonyms? Why are you pretending they're the same term? How can the blessed hope only be the rapture and something only for believers alive at that time? You mean all these other Christians who were martyred and persecuted and were faithful to the Lord for all these centuries didn't have the blessed hope? That's crazy. That's crazy. It's the return of Christ. Yes, there may be anesthesia, resurrection, or there may be harpezo, rapture, but it's the same blessed hope. They've redefined it beyond the limits of anything Scripture says or intends to say. Everybody understand? Okay. 
Let's go beyond this now. The day of the Lord, chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Now as the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. But you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. This, of course, relates to various passages, including Revelation 12. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you like a thief. For you are sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, be sober. And now he makes reference to things that Isaiah speaks about and that Paul speaks about in Ephesians 6, putting on the armor and so forth. Getting ready. Verse 9. But for God has not destined us for wrath. The wrath of God is poured out during the day of the Lord. The parousia inaugurates the day of the Lord. When the true church is raptured and resurrected, God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist. That is the day of the Lord. And it will climax with a single day, but it also it's, 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 it's an ambiguous term. It refers to a period as well as to a, one specific time. This has to do with the book of Daniel. The sons of light, sons of darkness motif are things that were well known to Jews. Now we know that Paul began his ministry in, Th in Thessalonica in the synagogue, didn't he? So there were Jewish believers who were there. And he's speaking to them about things that were known that we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, it was focal in the thinking of the Essenes. This conflict, coming conflict, between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. One of the challenges Paul had was to take things that were known to Jews and to explain them to people who are not Jewish. Explain them to people who are not Jewish. Now, Paul, in talking to these people, tells them certain things. He speaks to them right from the beginning about being persecuted. And he says to them, you're being persecuted by your own people just as the Jews are persecuting us. He tells the Thessalonians that what your families and your people and your community are doing to you for the sake of the gospel is the same thing that happens to Jews who believe. Bounce back very briefly to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. That is the Jewish churches, okay, in Israel. For you also endured the same suffering at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, meaning the unbelieving Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They drove out the believing Jews. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. Now, be careful of making this into a doctrine that Jews killed Jesus. You have to look at the other passages of Scripture in the book of Acts to understand what Paul is saying. It says in the book of Acts, Luke writes that it was the Jews together with Herod and the Romans, okay? They were all party to his, to his execution, okay? But then it says, they are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved with the results that they always fill up and measure their sins but wrath has come upon to the utmost. Okay. Unbelieving Jews 
persecuted Jewish Christians before any Christians persecuted Jews. Okay. <laughs> now, the ugly history of anti-Semitism perpetrated against the Jewish community in the name of Christ is appalling. It is an arrow in Satan's quiver that present, prevents Jews from being saved. Nonetheless, it is a fact that the rabbis, the Sanhedrin, instigated persecution against Jewish Christians before any Christian persecuted a Jew, to the point where they were trying to prevent Jewish believers from Christianizing Gentiles even. They wanted the Gentile God-fearers to convert to Judaism. Okay. Well, Paul's gospel was, no, you just need to have faith in Jesus. You don't need to become a Jew by way of religion and go under the law. This was the issue. Now, I can testify to this. I've dealt with this in the Jewish community many times. In our ministry, we have a sister in Israel who's one of our missionaries. She grew up in a Hasidic Jewish family, ultra-Orthodox. Ultra you know, you know, she spoke Yiddish as a kid growing up as a main language. When she became a believer in Jesus, her family held a funeral for her. They literally sat shiva for her. They had a funeral for her as if she were dead. And I know many other cases of things I could tell you. Okay. Well, in Israel, we had a joke that was no joke. We used to say if a frum, if an Orthodox Jew, got saved, the family would hold a funeral for them. But if a Muslim got saved, the family would also hold a funeral for them, only they would be at it. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> it was, we used to say it, and it was funny, but it was the reality. It was the reality. They took this guy from Nazareth who was preaching the gospel. He went to southern Lebanon, and they put a hand grenade on his neck with a cord attached and wrapped the masking tape around his neck, and they just blew his head right off. I mean, just blew his head off. It, the Baptist missionaries were able to identify his corpse from a, a shirt that his sister made him. It, it's, it's, it's a terrible world. It's, it's a terrible world, you know. When I see the world going on about Israel and how Israel violates human rights, my God, do you have any idea what... Hezbollah or Hamas or the Iranians would do or do do to a Muslim who, who becomes a believer in Jesus? Nobody says anything about it. Nobody says anything about it. But that's it. So this is the background. Now, I'd like to point out something. The word philipsis. The ellipsis, the word for tribulation, okay? Its etymological core meaning in Greek derives from the term constriction, constriction, like a boa constrictor. Think of a boa constrictor. It wraps itself around the prey, and then the grip becomes progressively tighter. So the muscle tissue of the boa constrictor becomes so condensed it becomes like bone. Too difficult to move. It doesn't begin as something that seems like it's going to be lethal. In Great Britain about four months ago or three months ago there was a professional snake handler who had snakes in his house and a, and a constrictor killed him in his house in England and he was a professional snake handler. The ellipsis derives from the term constriction. Persecution begins by getting into position <laughs> and then becomes progressive. For instance, here in California, you have people in Sacramento that are trying to <coughs> crack down on homeschoolers. A politician said about two weeks ago in California that parents have no constitutional right to say that their children K-12 
can be exempted from being taught that homosexuality, same-sex marriage, etc., are unnatural or are natural. You can't. You have no right to exempt your children from that. And they're demanding restrictions on materials used in homeschool education. It's like something we taught in the book of Daniel, the furnace of affliction is the name of the teaching. Once they get the laws on the books, I've seen this in Singapore, I'm seeing it in many places, <coughs> they will justify putting these laws on the books to stop radical Islam. But that's not Satan's real target. His real target is to use those laws against believers in Jesus. He may raise up radical Muslims or things like this in order to create enough public impetus to allow such legislation to go through. But once it does, it'll be used against the true body of Christ, you understand? It gets tighter and tighter. It doesn't begin, <coughs> gotcha. Orge is wham. The ellipsis is strangulation. You understand the difference? <coughs> they get the laws on the books. Now, we've spoken about this before. You'll be brought before magistrates and kings in some translations. You're seeing more and more judges usurping the power of parliament and Congress and legislating from the bench. Corrupt judges, no constitutional authority to do it. They just say a presidential an executive order issued by one president has no legal bearing other than during the administration of that president. Another president can come and cancel it, okay? It has to be a law passed by Congress that you just can't get rid of without re-legislating. So a, a judge comes along and says, no, you can't change that. But it's an executive order. You have no legal... In the present environment, understand something. The First, the Second, and the Fourth Amendment are all under heavy attack. I am not saying this politically. Attorney-client privilege is under attack. The real target of these things, we struggle not against flesh and blood. It's principalities. Satan's real target is to use these things against the body of Christ. You understand? To use these things against the body of Christ. I've already seen these things in Germany, where the state has taken homeschooled children away from their parents. And when they applied to come to the United States as refugees of religious persecution, because the law was a law that came from the Nazi era under Hitler, but it was still on the books. The Obama administration refused to give them a visa. Take their children. I mean, this, this, this is what happened. This is actually what happened. Um, it constricts, it gets tighter and tighter. Once they get in position, it's going to be tighter and tighter. Oh, we're going to have same-sex marriage. Okay. But now you have a bakery and you're Christians, you've got to make a cake. You don't want to make the cake? Well, then you have to pay them tens of thousands of dollars of, of damages because you've offended them. This is discrimination. You understand? That's how thalipsis works. It gets tighter and tighter till it gets to the point, as Isaiah said, they call good evil and they call evil good. It gets tighter and tighter to the point where they call that which is good evil 
and they call that which is evil good. Now, Isaiah says, woe to them. When when a society has gone that far, it has gone too far. You understand? When a society has gone that far, it has gone too far. Now, the reason Paul was writing about these issues to our friends in Thessalonica, to our forebearers in the faith, about the resurrection is because they were facing the possibility of martyrdom. Whenever in the English text you see bearing witness, the word is martyrion. If somebody is really bearing witness for Christ, it means they're willing to die for the cause of the gospel and for the name of the Lord. They're willing to die. If you're not willing to die for it, you're not a real witness. It's the same word in Greek. If you're not willing to die for what you believe, you're not a faithful witness. These guys were. So when Paul tells them, don't worry about the ones who die, he's saying, don't worry about it. They're going to execute. Yeah, they're gonna, don't worry about it. You'll come back with the Lord. Jesus said, Satan will put you in prison in 10 days, he told Smyrna. Don't fear the things you're about to suffer. The courage I have seen in Vietnam and China, particularly Vietnam, is incredible. It's absolutely remarkable. And again, I've been to Muslim countries like Indonesia and things. The courage is, is stunning. These things really happen. We don't think of it this way. Because in the English-speaking democracies, for 500 years, we've had more or less religious freedom. But read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. The, the people who gave us this freedom were all killed. They were all killed. William Tyndale and these guys, they all got knocked off. They all got knocked off. I tell people in England, we're reading the scriptures in the English language. It caused people their lives. We take it for granted. Well, the situation is going to emerge once again before the Lord comes where we will not be able to take it for granted. Now, what Satan is trying to do as we speak is to bamboozle sincere Christians into thinking. You don't have to worry about the boa constrictor choking you too tight. We'll be out of here before that happens. Don't prepare for the boa trying to tighten you up and, and, and kill you. We're gonna, we'll be out of here before that happens. Again, we're only talking about 500 years of relative religious freedom. That's now disappearing anyway, progressively. But only 500 years of it. I believe p- people in the present government, like Mr. Pence and Mr. Trump, over a period of respite. But the general trend has been in that direction. And it's, uh, it's going to be like we said in the furnace of affliction in the book of Daniel, even though the king didn't want to do it. The law was on the books, you understand. And and the king was was confronted with the legal realities, and he was forced to put Daniel on the lion's den. That's going to happen. Even if you get a good president or a good prime minister, we see what's going to happen. Now, if you know this is going to happen, and this is your mindset, If you know, as we get into 2 Thessalonians, the Antichrist is going to come and what's going to happen and what he's going to do. If you know these things ahead of time, you'll know what to do when it happens. We're told in the book of Daniel chapter 11, among other places. You'll know what to do. You'll certainly know what to expect. But if you think just because you were born in California... You don't have to go through what those believers in Vietnam go through. That's what they're basically saying. Because we live in California, we're gonna, or Texas, or Georgia, we're going to be out of here. That's only the believers in Vietnam and Africa and China. They, they, they have to do it, not us. No. Those Christians, those churches are more faithful. <laughs> They don't have the freedom or the affluence or the resources we have. But they got a lot more Jesus and a lot more faithful. I know, I've been there. 
Now, thank God for the freedom and resources we have, but rarely, if ever, in the history of the church has so little been done by so many with so much. <laughs> That's just the way it is, Laodicea. They're blind. Laodicea is blind. It doesn't know it's Laodicea. Buy sob to anoint your eyes. People are being bamboozled to think. They know the serpent is there. They know it's beginning to choke. But they think it's not going to happen so quickly. They see things getting worse and worse. Now, many people who are of the pre-tribulational predisposition, they look at these realities they see in the newspapers, on the internet, on TV news and things, and they read the scripture and they rethink their theology. And the Holy Spirit begins to show them that this pre-trib stuff isn't right. <laughs> There's more and more people realizing it's not right, okay? How many people here used to be pre-trib and the Lord showed you it's nuts? Look around. I'd get the same thing in a lot of places. Same thing. A lot of you. Those who love the Lord, the Holy Spirit showing them through the scriptures and just in light of reality, looked at in light of the scriptures, this stuff does not add up. Satan is trying to bamboozle these people so they won't be ready. It is going to fuel the great falling away. It is going to fuel the great falling away. The most serious will be those who follow the word faith money preachers. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Bind Satan and all of this stuff. Well, <laughs> when it doesn't work and persecution comes, they're going to be the first ones that will not only fall away, but they will fall away and betray one another. You understand? I've said this 25 years ago. The ones who are going to fall away and betray us tomorrow or the ones who are listening to people like Kenneth Copeland today. They're the ones who are going to do it. They're the ones who are going to do it. You don't have to suffer. You're a king. Oh, boy. Just bind Satan or you don't have any faith in him. Now, that is the background from 1 Thessalonians. We will begin with 2 Thessalonians after the break. How long, Marco, is the break? 20 minutes. Venti minutos. Okay. Have a break. 20 minutes. We are back here in 20 minutes.